Do we have any announcements this morning? Do we have any announcements this morning? Hi there. So, the Christmas lamb went really well yesterday, the play we're doing. And we'll have another performance today at 4 p.m. Doors open at 3.30. You don't have to register. Just come. We have about 40 seats left, and we want to see every single one of you here. We want the pews filled. And then next week is the Adoration Parade. Uh, We'll need some cookies baked. And if you want to bring them next Sunday in the morning when you come to service, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. I would like to mention to everyone that the play is delightful. There are many people who have spent a great deal of time practicing for this, and we appreciate Rod and his family and all that have participated. Do we have any visitors this morning? Welcome. We have a gift for you. Um, I would like to mention to all of you that most of us are aware of the fact that we lost our beloved Pastor Al in May. And we have a uh, committee that is in the process of trying to find us a permanent pastor But in the meantime, we have several very qualified people in our congregation that have been able to step up and give us great messages. And then we have experienced the opportunity to hear several visiting pastors, retired pastors. And we want to welcome Pastor Susie Moore this morning for our message. May we bring in the light of the the light of Christ at this time. Will you join with me for the call to worship, please? A new season begins today. It is the season known as Advent. Advent begins a time of waiting for the arrival or coming of Jesus into the world. Watch and we wait with great anticipation for the one who will change the world. Shall we join in our hymn of faith, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel? Rejoice, wait, watch, the light of hope. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. The darkness has long been upon us. We long for the light, the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The light has not yet come. We wait and watch for the dawning of God's glory. This one candle casts its light into the darkness. It reminds us to stay awake and watchful for the promised one. Oh, Easton, thank you. 
For the promised one will come to us at an unexpected hour. Easton will light our first candle of our Advent wreath for hope. How we long for the light of your presence, holy God. Guide us from the night of our hopelessness and lead us with joy towards the dawning of your new day. God of wonders, there is excitement and anticipation in the air. From yesterday to today, something has shifted. There is electricity in the air, and it is the beginning of being aware of a power greater than we have ever known, a power of presence that is about to make its way into our world. Our senses are fully engaged. Our voices sing familiar songs. Our eyes feast on the beauty of decorations, the scent of candles, cookies, and fresh cut pine trees fill the air. Be with us now as our hearts warm awaiting the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will we please remain standing for our praise songs?
Let us pray. Lord of all seasons, we come into this new year for the church with hope, with expectation, with excitement for what is to come. And yet we also come with worries and fears, with prayer concerns that are on our hearts that only you know. Lord, we pray that you will hear our prayers this Advent season as you do every season and every day and every moment. We lift up our prayers for those who are hurting and need to know the power of Advent and Christmas. We pray for those who are struggling physically, mentally, spiritually, Chase the darkness that haunts them. Chase it away with the light of Jesus Christ that breaks through the darkness. We pray for those who are in harm's way, especially our military, our law enforcement, our health workers that, that go in, our firefighters that go in, Be their guide. Be their hands. And Lord, we pray for ourselves that in this season, we will find once again the power, the love, the gentleness, the joy, and the new life that comes from a child with whom we wait. Hear us now, O oh Lord. Hear us now as we come before you with one voice, as one family, as followers of Jesus Christ, as we offer to you the perfect prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Thank you, choir. The prophet Isaiah foretold of a world where swords are beaten into plowshares and shears into pruning hooks, where people no longer learn war or hatred, where all people are treated justly. We know that we do not yet live in such a world, yet we do come close each week when we come to the table of Holy Communion. Here all people are invited. Here the love of God is shared equally. Here there is no great or small. Here all people can share the abundance of God's kingdom. In coming to the table and in remembering Jesus and his sacrifice, we receive the hope of that kingdom to come. Let us prepare our hearts to receive Holy Communion. Will you join in the communion hymn, Lo, how a rose air blooming, standing on the second verse. We come to this table with expectations and hopes and fears and dreams just like the disciples did so long ago. So we remember that night that was a mixture of worry and fear and hope and expectation. And we remember that Jesus gathered with them all and he gave them something to remember. For he took the bread. Do we have bread? He took the bread and he gave thanks, asked for God's blessings upon it, and gave it to them and said, Take and eat, all of you, for this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, I just ask one thing, remember me. And in like manner, he took the cup and again, asking for God's blessings upon it and giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, take and drink all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant sealed by my blood for the forgiveness of sin whenever you drink it. Again, please remember me. And so we all come to this table as one. We are all welcome at this table as one. We all come with expectations to be renewed. For this is the body and blood of Christ 
He is the one who extends the invitation. All are welcome. Dear Heavenly Father, as we enter into your presence during this holy Advent season, we fully understand that the gift that you bring is everlasting life. You came as a baby, you lived your life as a servant, and your body was broken at Calvary for the sins of all mankind. And we break this bread among us now, and we shall never forget what occurred that day at Calvary. And now the prayer continues. Father God, may we live in joyful anticipation and hope, and may the cup we drink at this table not only remind us of the gift of your Son, but of your steadfast presence in our lives. Guide us to put our hope in you that we may act faithfully in response to your love. We pray in the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, the hope of the world. Amen. On the grounds of the United Nations headquarters, there is a statue of the prophet Isaiah beating a sword into plowshare. It is a symbol of hope for a world of peace and justice, where all people have what they need. We know that such a world does not yet exist, but we who are the body of Christ on earth are called to give of ourselves to help bring about such a world. We must honestly examine ourselves to help bring about such a world. We must also give of our finances, time, and talents to minister hope and justice to the world. Let us now bring our gifts 
tithes and offerings before the Lord. Now the deacons shall come forward to collect the offering. God of all gifts, bless what we offer today. In our giving, may we remember that we are planning ahead for the unexpectedness of life. Amen. Our scripture today is Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come. Let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their shears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This ends the reading of our scripture today. Good morning. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. After uh, listening to Laura's wonderful, um, oh, she just walked out on me. Um, <laughs> um, after listening to her, her wonderful meditations today, all I could think, I was, I was giggling behind her because I'm thinking, she just took half my sermon. This is a new year. Do you know that? 
Happy New Year, church. Because on the first Sunday of Advent, we begin the new liturgical year. There's a big word. So Happy New Year. We come to this time of Advent and the um, Christmas season ahead with anticipation. It's like waiting for that new baby to be born in the family. The weird thing about Advent is that we're anticipating and looking forward to something to happen that is, has already happened. We're hoping to see the Christ child, but we see the Christ child every day within our hearts. However, the one thing I have found about Advent, sadly, is that often Advent becomes more of a stressor than a joyful. Um, I had lunch with a, um, one of the cluster ministers of the um, uh, mid-American cluster that, I, that Springfield is in, and uh, something was said about a, a Christmas party for ministers, that had, an invitation that had gone out. And his comment was, oh, great, one more thing to put on my calendar. That's, why, that's how some may begin to feel about Advent and the whole, the whole month of December. You've got more things to do, more stuff to take care of. You got, you've already cleaned the house, I hope, because you know, you've already had all the family in. But then they dirtied it up again, so now you've got to do it all over again. You've got to do all this Christmas shopping. You've got to decorate if you haven't already done so. And some people have already, they're way ahead. Then there's always, our, and what the heck was that? <laughs> God. Um, maybe he doesn't like what I'm about to say. Um, we get so stressed out that we forget that the four Sundays of Advent, okay, let's see how good you are. Today is the day of hope. What's next week? What? Not the word I was looking for. (laughs) It's hope, peace, hope, peace. The third Sunday is joy. That's the pink candle, joy. And the fourth Sunday is love. Did you say love? Okay. Hope, peace, joy, and love. Somehow, sometimes we allow the world to get in the way of what we're really supposed to be celebrating and it goes away. It goes, it, it, we, we lose the hope, peace, joy, and love, which leads to, of course, new life in Jesus Christ. And the world wants us to lose that. We really, really, really does. The world would love for us nothing else better than for us to forget what this season is all about. The world is bombarding us with yet one more, yet one more um, shooting. I heard on the news this morning that the the um, shooting at the Walmart was the 608th or 680th mass shooting in America in 2022. Don't let Satan push out what this season is about. Don't let Satan, bring about stress and fear. Let the light of Christ 
shine this advent with you. The, the scripture from Isaiah is a, a time, it, it, it's, it's sort of multi-layered. It's talking about something yet to come. The second coming of Christ, as some would interpret it. But beautifully, it is, it is a scripture of hope. It is a scripture that says all the nations of the world will come to the mountain of the Lord. All the nations will bow down. All the nations will hammer their swords into plowshares and will listen to the word of God and be guided by the word of God and they will study war no more. Now, if you're like me, I have, you know, that spiritual going through my head. You know, gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield. Down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. I ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. What a wonderful vision. Isaiah 2, I believe, when people ask me about that one line in the Lord's Prayer that says, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they say, what does exactly that mean? I think Isaiah is giving us that vision. Isaiah says, this is what God intends for the world, for all his children to come, to lay down their weapons of war, to lay down their differences. And we know we have a lot of differences in our world. And it seems to me that they're getting more contentious. We can't, people have, people have forgotten how to just sit down together with our differences and listen to one another. You know, I don't think that when all the people of the world come together, I don't think Isaiah is saying that everyone's going to agree. But what they are going to do is hopefully everyone someday will be able in prayer and in fellowship and in hope and love and joy be able to sit down together and talk about it. To listen to each other because when we listen to each other, we learn from one another. This is a scripture that brings us hope for the season. It is a scripture that is meant to say, come to God. It is a scripture that is about what we expect, expect for Advent. When I was um, in high school, um, when I was in high school, I went on a work trip two summers, um, to a place called Hazel Green, Kentucky. Anybody here ever heard of Hazel Green, Kentucky? Hazel Green Academy? No? Hazel Green Academy was a school in the um, early foothills, you might call them, of of, uh, Appalachia on the very eastern edge of Kentucky. It was owned by the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And it was, um, it was a private school, but 
if, but you paid, I, I remember they told me it was $125 a semester or $125 a year or something like that for the kids to go there. And a lot of them stayed in the dorms. That included room and board. Because you see, Hazel Green was in what at that time, <coughs> years ago, was um, considered the second poorest county in the United States. So if a family could pay $5 a semester for their child to go to Hazel Green, they went to Hazel Green. If they could pay $125, they paid $125. But that was my first trip into the mountains. And on our, we worked and did, we did um, our group from Iowa, um, we did uh, Bible school, vacation Bible school the week that we were there. And we went around with our church vehicle that we had and picked up the kids in the mountains and brought them back to the school. We had to teach them to flush the toilets because they were used to going in outhouses. We took them to the what they called jot them down store if we thought they needed new clothes or new shoes to see if there was something there that they could have. On our, and then in the afternoon, we did that in the morning. In the afternoon, we worked around the school. These work groups that would come in from all over would provide free labor. But that was our ministry, was to help the school. And it's amazing what a bunch of teenagers can do with a little supervision and a little, and a little training. But the best part was, well, maybe not the best part, but the one point of the whole week that I remember the most was when we went up to a place called Natural Bridge. It was up on a hill, and it had this bridge completely made out of stone. And we worshipped on the top of the mountain on this bridge. I think the reason the Bible talks about the mountains so much is because the mountain was considered to be the home of God up in the mountains. And if you've ever been in the Rockies or the Appalachians, I think you probably have all felt that feeling. That feeling of power and yet gentleness. That feeling of, I can't even describe it. But you feel in the presence of God. Some of us even commented that we said we wouldn't have been surprised had um, we turned around and seen Jesus sitting on the, on the ledge with us, looking out over creation. But we don't have to be in the mountains to have mountaintop experiences. And Advent asks us to open our hearts and our minds and our souls to Feel once again, to see, to know, to expect the power and presence of God in our lives changing us. It is, uh, you know, the last time I was here, I talked about change. Advent is about change too. It's about reflection. It's about getting excited and actually seeking God if you haven't done so already. It's a time to let sh the light shine and know that that light is shining. Seek that light in the darkness that the world wants to surround us with. It is a time to look for miracles. And I look for them all the time. Do you? Do you expect to find Jesus? Do you expect 
Do you expect a miracle to happen? There's a, um, an old story about, you know, an area that was in a drought and they hadn't had rain for a long, 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 long time. I'm sure you've heard the story. It's an old story. And the minister prayed, gathered everybody in the town, and they prayed for rain. And he looked around and he said, none of you expect a miracle today except one. And they all went, well, we prayed for the rain. He says, but only that child brought an umbrella. Do you expect a miracle? Do you expect to be transformed and changed by this season or just bogged down? Do you expect to hear God calling you to the mountain to rest, to find peace, to find hope and joy and love? Do you expect to meet Jesus? I hope you do. I hope you do. Uh, Laura mentions mentioned the statue that is across the street from the United Nations, which I was going to tell you about anyway. Um, but behind that statue is what is called the Wall of Isaiah. And it has engraved on the wall Isaiah 2, 4. All the nations will come to the, the mountain of the Lord. They shall beat their, their, plow, their, their swords and shields into plowshares. They will study war no more. It is an ideal vision for how the world should be. Unfortunately, 2,000 years later, we're not there. But you are called to bring about the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. You don't have to wait for some end time. You don't have to wait for some miracle to happen. You can be the conduit for it to begin right here on earth with your prayers, with your kindness, with your giving, with your with your um, all the ministries, the wonderful ministries that you all are doing. You can be the light that someone else needs to see in their darkness. You can be the hope that is offered to someone who is in despair. You can be the joy for those who are struggling with the season. And you can be the ambassador for Jesus Christ that God is calling each and every one of you to be. In the holy mountain of the Lord, all wars and strife will cease. In the holy mountain of the Lord, Creation will be at peace. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and pull us into yourself. May it be so. Amen.
If you would like to give your life to Christ, have you done it? I'm looking out kind of like, you know, the preaching to the choir. But what I'm asking is, are you willing to give your life to Christ again and again and again? Are you willing to hear God calling and follow God's guidance? Are you willing to give your life to Christ right here, right now, once again? And start this season off right. And I didn't do this the last time I was here, but I will tell, say to you, if you would like to make that a public confession of faith, I would invite you to come down as we sing our final hymn of today. Song in the air, there's a sky in the sky, there's a mother's deep prayer, and a baby's low cry. Out the flag of the cradles are May God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you. Shine upon you. May you be the light of Christ shining into the darkness. For Christ said, I am the light. But then he said, you are the light. So may God indeed bless you and keep you. But in turn, may you use those blessings to be a blessing to someone you meet. Amen. Oh,